Does this ever happen to you? Then you're in luck. Today, in a departure from our normal Boulder-centric content, <laughs> we're going to be experimenting and exploring with a, a whole new area called endurance. I'm Dan Bell, climber and performance coach. This is my co-host, Jason Hooper, and uh, namesake of the channel, and our friend uh, Anna Hazelnut, budding bouldering enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> is it going to be an easy day for them? It might not be too bad for Anna. <laughs> <laughs> So I was already pumped. Yeah. And you want me to do that again? <sighs> that's, a, that's a thing, right? It's, like, it's a little hard to tell for you. Come on. <laughs> Tired. I already feel gassed out. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, come on, come on, come on, come on. 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. Yeah. You gotta tell for you the first, like, how, how deep you need to go. But it's like, that's like, with 4x4s, where people tend to fall. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's just so, so boring. We'll be looking at a variety of uh, methods and interventions with a special eye towards boulders, though many of the principles should still work nicely for sport climbers or trad climbers. To some extent, endurance is just another facet of strength. Um, we tend to think of strength as ability to output a maximum force, but just as important as that for almost all athletic endeavors is the ability to sustain an adequate force long enough to accomplish whatever the task is that you're trying to accomplish. So. For boulders, it is easy to get sucked into trying to build up a maximum strength because it sort of unlocks new moves and new problems. And there's a very like there's a very obvious initial correlation between sort of max strength and an ability to execute moves. But endurance is what lets you send boulders. It's what lets you be reliable with sending boulders so that you manage to complete your projects as opposed to punting off the end. It lets you take advantage of a wider set of possible betas for a given climb without being restricted to just doing something that's sort of as short as possible when your endurance is better, by which I mean your ability to sustain a given percentage of intensity is higher, each climb that you do in a session will be relatively less tiring so that you'll be able to do basically more harder climbs in less time over the course of your session, which will give you better technique practice and a more stressful training load, which will both contribute to your, uh, your continued improvement and rate of improvement over time. There's often this false dichotomy that comes up between just getting stronger and getting more endurance. Um, one of the sort of all-time fun quotes from, I think, Tony Nero was, if you're, <laughs> if you're not strong enough, there's nothing to endure, <laughs> or something along those lines. But the problem is that any of these things, if you run too far with it, will plateau. So very often you're going to hit an initial plateau with max strength while you're very far from your capacity and endurance. Um, and so while it's worth continuing to grind on your max strength in that period, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to be got out of endurance that will support the strength as well as your overall growth and development as a climber. Such endurance. We are athletes. Such athletes. <laughs> so really, when you're, when you're thinking about training just about anything for climbing, but in this case endurance, your first two choices are on-the-wall training or off-the-wall training. Within on-the-wall training, you can do ropes or boulders, um, and then in this case, within those subcategories for training endurance, you have to reach failure or near failure. That's the, the stress of the system that you're looking for. And so the general ways to accomplish that is either a continuous effort where you're doing one relatively big long set or intermittent sets. And that's where you're doing a sequence of challenging repetitions with short rest in order to in some reach failure. With that as a foundation, there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, sort of trim and tailor endurance training to best fit your circumstance. but there's a handful of exercises or uh, protocols that I find to be particularly effective as well as commonly available, and we're going to walk through some of those. So we're going to start with circuiting, um, which is just any continuous climbing on the wall done more or less to failure in one set. The two variations of this that we're going to demonstrate here are two very common ones. One is a custom circuit on a standard wall, something like the 2016 moon board, but they can be done on kilter boards or anything else. The other one is on a designated circuit wall that they have set here at Mesa Rim. Um, a lot of gyms will have spray walls or other sort of sport climbing training walls that have similar numbered circuits set up where you can simply follow the numbers. That said, you can do the exact same type of training with a little bit of customization by either traversing around the bouldering area in a gym or by linking up uh, some number of boulders such that you're up and down climbing rather than jumping off and getting back on. 
one of the simplest possible ways to do this is to simply up and down climb a, a pretty steep, pretty juggy climb so that you can reach failure without too much skin damage and very little risk of any kind of like tweak or injury. I really like circuits because they do a good job of allowing a sort of arbitrarily long climb at a desired level of intensity. They help you experiment with the, the feeling and execution of different levels of failure, and they seem to carry over very well to uh, maintaining intensity on the wall. The downside is that not all gyms have good preset circuits, and if they don't, it can be somewhat challenging to set your own climbs uh, at the right difficulty if you're not experienced with that. If you don't have access to good circuits at your gym and you're not comfortable setting your own, you can try this next method, which is repeats. Repeats are the broad class of things that people normally call 4x4s. You're just going to pick some number of boulders of a relatively consistent difficulty and do them as quickly as possible back to back until you reach your desired level of fatigue. By skewing the intensity, as we'll discuss later, you can make these a little harder and shorter or a little bit longer and a little bit more, uh, a little bit more fatiguing. Both of these can work quite well for different cases. The biggest mistake I see people make is picking stuff that is a bit too hard. Wow, see, like, I already feel gassed out. Nope. <laughs> Two. Which will generally result in longer rests than were intended between climbs and generally falling a little bit too early. So you fail to really stimulate some of the sort of like longer lasting energy systems. Um, in a way, it ends up being like just a kind of haggard bouldering session <laughs> rather than like a smooth and progressible sort of like endurance training method. Ignoring sort of like physiologic models, you get better at what you train. And so four by four and repeat type things give you a lot of practice doing hard things sequentially with small amounts of rests. Meanwhile, circuits help you get better at staying on the wall and doing relatively hard moves for longer. So that practically kind of is, is the difference that you get between those two. I like to do my endurance on the wall when possible because it's, it's sort of the most sport specific possible method. It's pretty fun. You get to sort of move and flow and experiment with technique and things. And there's a lot of soft benefits to it. However, there are times where you're traveling or you're at home or your skin's all beat up and you just don't really have access or you just don't want to deal with uh, having to do your endurance on the wall, but you still want to get a good pump in and make sure that you're, you're <laughs> maintaining your progress and trajectory. This is a really good time to do training off the wall, uh, especially on fingerboards which are well isolated and let you just really focus on getting really, really tired. And if you can't get into the gym to do your endurance, a convenient solution can be to get a fingerboard for the house. That way you can separate out your endurance from the rest of your training and you have a little bit more flexibility with your schedule overall. And along those lines, we're psyched that today's episode is sponsored by Frictitious. They make a really cool door mount for the house. You can put it up and take it down quickly and easily and it provides uh, a really convenient training supplement. Thanks for the transition, Dan. And lucky for us, Frictitious is running a 20% sale on any hangboard you purchase with a doorway mount. It's the perfect solution for climbers that want to train finger strength, endurance, or even some finger rehab, but don't want to deal with permanently mounting a board to the wall. No drilling, no having to buy a drill or borrow one from your neighbor, no cleaning up your drill marks if you change locations, just a super simple solution to your at-home training needs. It literally takes seconds to mount and dismount, and for added convenience, you can even have it delivered with your hangboard of choice pre-attached to the doorway mount. If you're ready to get started on a setup like this, make sure you check out the link in the description and grab that 20% off. On a fingerboard, there's probably merit to a continuous approach where you're just doing very long hangs, but I don't see it done much. I don't like it personally, and so I probably wouldn't recommend it at this point in time. Um, that said, repeaters, which is sort of the, uh, the intermittent method on fingerboards, have a long tried and tested history and they seem to work quite well. Repeaters are great. Their downside and their strength is kind of the same, which is they allow enough consistency to be kind of miserably grueling, but they definitely work. There are a number of different tempos that you can use for fingerboard repeaters. Some classics are sort of 7-3, 5-5, and 10-5, um, where that's the amount of time that you hang relative to the amount of time that you rest. So 7-3 is really popular, but I find it's actually pretty hard for most people to let go of the rung at all and get back on before the three seconds are off, much less chalking up, which can be essential, especially if you're sweaty. So I kind of like 5-5 five, five or 10-5 personally, but any of those three works well, and you can experiment with uh, slightly different cadences to see what seems to sort of resonate best with you. You do want to keep the rest relatively low, though, so you're not achieving significant recovery in between hangs. Realistically, around 10 seconds in between hangs is probably about as high as you want to go for 
practical endurance training purposes. Now, with repeaters, a lot of times people will pick a number like, uh, like a 10 second hang with a five second rest, for example, and will continue doing these until their first rep where they fail to hang for 10 seconds. I like to have a target like that 10 seconds, but also a lower bound threshold. So I typically will do something like 10 five repeaters, but then I will have failure be denoted by an inability to complete at least five seconds. So let's say you can do 10 hangs where you hit 10 seconds, no problem. All of a sudden at the, uh, the 11th hang, you're kind of at like eight seconds and then it drops off pretty quickly. Um, one or two hangs later, you only can do four seconds and now you're done. I like this as an approach because with a lot of these different endurance training methods, it's not entirely intuitively clear when you've failed, when you've reached sufficient fatigue. So what you're really looking for is significant drop off. So there's generally periods where you're snappy and fresh, a little bit less snappy and maybe a little powered down, but you don't feel particularly fatigued. And then there comes a point where kind of the wheels come off and there's a significant reduction relative to whatever the initial intensity was. Um, and so I find that when you hit that point of significant reduction is generally a good time to stop. While we're at it, a conditionally convenient training option is doing endurance on a campus board. For some people, it can be nicer than fingerboarding. There's just a little bit more movement involved and a little bit less just hanging in the same fixed angle. Additionally, it is consistent, so it's very easy to record the amount of time that you spent on the board or the number of moves that you did. Um, and it also provides a very straightforward overload mechanism by which you either do more repetitions or you add more weight. So I think there are times where this can be really, really useful, especially if your skin hurts and you can kind of tape up and just get on the big rungs and kind of charge around until you reach failure. Remembering, of course, that failure should not be that you simply can't do a given rung spacing. It should be that you kind of peel off the wall, your hands open up at around the, the time limit that you're looking for. Generally 30 to 120 seconds is a, is a great range. That's going to somewhat constrain the intensity by itself, but you wanna make sure that you're not going like one lap up and then falling off. Um, you can either do continuous up and down climbing or if the down climbing is either aggravating for the elbows or it's just a little bit too complex given your, your level of experience, you can go up sort of as far as you can, hop off immediately, get, get back on and keep doing uh, laps on it as you would with uh, the boulder repeats. But in this case, it's just a very simple sort of foot free boulder. It doesn't really matter what the spacings are. You can control the difficulty a little bit that way. But um, since you're mostly looking for just sort of movement and time and retention, you can kind of do whatever spacings you want, kind of wandering around on the board. Um, if you are strong or very strong, you can do the campusing all uh, without feet on smaller rungs or even with a weight vest so that you achieve failure in about the right amount of time. If you don't really campus or you're a newer climber or you're just got way stronger fingers than sort of pull strength, it can be pretty useful to have your feet on something so that you can kind of support your weight as you move around the board. The last endurance training category that we're going to go over today is in some ways obvious, rope climbing. Rope climbing is great because it's <laughs> social, typically available, set with this purpose in mind and it's generally a sort of like fun and more physically gentle way to get very very pumped the downsides is that a lot of rope climbing in gyms is not super steep which means that you're potentially going to be very much flaming out your forearms while sort of sparing some of the bigger muscles if you've already done a bunch of bouldering over the course of the day that can be good but i think for boulders especially there's a lot of merit to doing most of your endurance climbing on fairly steep terrain as it requires a bit more control and awareness um, and also gives you a little bit of free volume in some of the bigger muscles while also letting you use bigger, more comfortable and more ergonomic holds. So it can be a, a pro or a con depending on the situation. When you're doing rope climbing, you can do intermittent or continuous climbing as with any of these other methods. With top roping, I think it's typically more convenient to do uh, sort of intermittent laps with relatively short rest. In this case, somewhere between zero and 90 seconds. If you rest more than 90 seconds, there's gonna be really significant um, ATP replenishment and you're gonna see somewhat different adaptations. You can do continuous climbing as well, either by, typically by up and down climbing or by up climbing one route, down climbing a different route and climbing up a third route, something like that. That is relatively commonly done as an effective way of linking things up on lead, but I personally find it to be pretty cumbersome on top rope. So laps on top rope or, uh, or up downs on lead. I definitely prefer top ropes for endurance climbing because I think they're faster. There's less interruption of flow for clipping as this relates to, to boulders, especially. Um, and if, and when you inevitably fall, if you're not super duper pumped, um, it's easy to swing back to the wall and kind of continue climbing. Meanwhile, with lead climbing, again, especially for boulders, I find 
the clipping to be a little bit of a headache. Um, I find that it's easy to fall before you're very tired, especially because boulders are typically not that comfortable on ropes. And it's just too cumbersome to get back on the wall and it's hard to get as high a quality pump. Practically with rope climbing, with top roping especially, you have the choices of single lap attempts, uh, doubles or triples. All three of these are good and pretty viable for bouldering. To some extent, single hard pitches are going to be the closest map to bouldering, but in my experience, they don't progress as smoothly. Um, I'm a big fan of doubles because they're long enough that you can get a somewhat more comprehensive pump um, and it's enough moves that increasing that move count slightly is a relatively small change and so you can get relatively good consistent progress. Um, triples can be nice too because it essentially guarantees failure if you're even approximately in the right intensity range and it can also progress relatively well but as you get sort of towards longer triples or beyond triples um, suddenly the the specificity and the projection onto bouldering can be less favorable. As an aside, uh, one of the off-the-wall tools that we've been playing with recently is the critical force function on the tin deck. It has a fixed protocol of 24 reps of 7-3 repeaters, where you pull as hard as you can on the device for 7 seconds and then rest for 3 seconds and repeat 24 times. This is a little bit arbitrary as far as protocols go. You can do it shorter or longer and you can have different rest periods, but it provides a pretty wicked pump, a, a really nice try hard kind of mindless um, burnout function at the end of a session. And it's pretty interesting to see what your plots look like and have some numbers to track for the, uh, <laughs> the more number nerdy among us. I think I really Whoa, know. Whoa, that looks so much different. What was yours like? Ready, watch that. So yeah, there's okay. yours. Whoa. So far, we've talked about a variety of different ways you can go about climbing until you get tired, but we've been a little light on details. This can be a little confusing, especially with all the sort of mixed information out there and the number of choices that we've even presented you with to make. Happily, though, the more general your training goals are and the less experience you are with these training protocols, the more receptive your body's gonna be. So given that boulders mostly aren't training to do a specific limit lead route, most types of endurance training will work well for boulders, especially newer boulders. So there's a, there's a very high degree of uh, forgiveness. And if you can kind of by hook or by crook, find a method that is comfortable and fun to you such that you're able to do it fairly regularly and achieve failure or near failure a couple times a session, a couple times a week, you will almost certainly see a very clear improvement. Okay, so as a quick note, why are we not talking about what everyone else talks about in endurance videos, which is energy systems? The reason is, while we have a reasonable sense of what the energy systems are, and even to some extent how they work, there's a remarkable lack of compelling evidence about their exact contributions to different type of exercise, how different exercise interventions affect those energy systems and how they adapt, and especially within the realm of climbing, there's close to no evidence at all about how any of these things tie together. There's not a clear actionable line that I'm aware of or have been able to find between intervention and outcome. And so to some extent, it's sort of as simple as you want to train things that look roughly like what you're trying to accomplish. Bouldering already does the shortest order things. So we would like to do something a bit longer to sort of support that. This whole big middle range is basically just anaerobic gly glycolysis. Um, and the reason why that is somewhat useful is because it seems to be in most people somewhat dominant between sort of 30 and 120 seconds. That just tells us that we have roughly that much forgiveness in where we're trying to do our, our training. If you do it a little bit on the shorter end, it's gonna blend a little bit with the, the phosphogen system and the sort of faster order replenishment. If you do it a little bit on the longer end, it's gonna bleed over a little bit to certain facets of the Krebs cycle and getting into some sort of more like aerobic stuff. But for the most part, anywhere between 30 and 120 seconds is gonna overlap fairly nicely and it's all gonna support kind of the same systems in kind of the same way. Most of what we're trying to do is essentially anaerobic. That means that you will probably get pretty good traction on any effort lasting between 30 seconds and about two minutes. 
This of course blends and blurs a little bit longer, a little bit shorter will all be fine. But things under 30 seconds to some extent are well sampled just by bouldering. Your typical boulder problem at sort of three to 10 moves is going to take sort of 10 to 30 seconds. So you're kind of doing that already just with your normal bouldering, whether it's, whether it's a kind of flashing or volume or whatever your normal bouldering workouts is, typically samples that pretty well. With intensity, it really is fairly forgiving, but it's common and a bit too easy for boulders to either try too hard and not really get into a true endurance realm, which again is definitely at least 30 seconds. You know, realistically, you probably want a minimum of sort of 45 seconds, but somewhere in the 30 to 120 second range. If you're failing in less than 30 seconds, you're essentially just bouldering and you're kind of either kidding yourself or not gonna make very consistent progress. Conversely, people can sometimes think they're gonna do some endurance climbing, so they're gonna go top rip some like 10 A's when they're climbing like V10 and you're either not getting remotely close to taxing your systems or you're being required to do like 300 plus moves to be able to get meaningfully tired. So you want to pick an intensity that allows you to stay on the wall for at least 30 seconds and you want it to be hard enough that you get really quite gassed before sort of two to three minutes. As far as volume, I think that a minimum of two sets is generally necessary uh, to see consistent progress. You might be able to get away with one for maintenance or for early progress when you're very new to it, but generally two or three tends to have good progress for boulders when done at the end of sessions. Um, you're not really relying on it for the totality of the stress of the session. It's just sort of a finishing set and a chance to get a couple of good pump exposures into the session. And I see really quite good traction with this uh, with climbers of basically all levels. If you're well-trained or you have a lot of time or you are transitioning into sport climbing or something like that, it can be useful to get as many as sort of like five sets to failure in a session. Beyond that, I think you're looking at really kind of diminishing returns at best. When you're looking at rest, you have amount of rest in between laps and an amount of rest in between sets. I think the rest in between laps should be relatively short, 90 seconds or less and typically 30 seconds or less. Um, but you can feather this a little bit as a progression method. So if you have, for moderately hard boulders, you're able to do them all to completion with a 30 second rest in between. It's pretty easy to creep that down to 20 or 15 or 10 seconds, which is going to make everything harder by virtue of letting you recover a little bit less. And eventually you can kind of glue these all together so that they're immediately back to back. Or if you're feeling really ambitious, you can actually glue them together as a circuit. So to some extent, striving to minimize the rest in between laps as you gain fitness as a method of making things harder is great. Um, I think that the opposite is typically the case when you're looking at the rest in between sets where you want the rest to be sort of as long as possible. If you have a reasonable amount of time, you can get through three sets of endurance with sort of 10 minute rests in sort of 30 minutes and you can fit some of your, uh, your strength training in with it. So with roughly 10 minute rest in between sets, that should give you about as much recovery and about as fresh an effort as you can get without having like a really impractical amount of time for your session. For boulders, I think it's good to do endurance at the end of the session. This is twofold. One, because more priority exercises should be done first. And since you are first and foremost, a boulder is sort of the, uh, the premise here. Doing your sort of projecting, hard bouldering and sort of novelty work at the start of the session is gonna have a better payoff um, while doing your endurance, which is sort of a lower priority uh, supportive training. Second is just uh, generally advisable. But additionally, being a bit tired from hard projecting is going to just let you achieve sort of a metabolic fatigue failure doing endurance more rapidly and on to some extent more comfortable easier training which is probably a net benefit and at worst not much of a detractor however if you were to do endurance training first it would significantly undermine your ability to project effectively uh, your movement would be compromised and you'd have significantly reduced force output so on days where you're training both projecting and endurance endurance should be done last finally you have frequency people seem to respond best to moderately high frequency once a week, we'll basically not do it. And so that's one of the things that I see as a, as a common failure mode. One is trying stuff that's a bit too hard so that you don't really get into a true like endurance realm. And the other one is just including sort of token endurance once a week or every other week or something like that. I think that for a lot of training interventions and this one in particular, a minimum of twice a week is necessary to see consistent progress. And it seems that three times works better. So. When I'm training endurance or I'm having clients train endurance, I try to have them do some endurance at the end of their sessions, basically every session that they train. Tip one is pick climbs that are as 
skin friendly, tendon friendly, comfortable, ergonomic, and enjoyable as possible. If you pick climbs that are tedious or have movement that is just kind of clunky and unenjoyable, or the holds are painful, or the texture is too rough, not only will you not enjoy doing it, not want to do it, not try as hard on it, but it will sort of actively undermine the rest of your training. So comfortable, fun climbs, if and whenever possible. Second is steep boards seems to be really nice for doing endurance for bouldering because it has sort of more of that sort of powerful bouldery nature to it. It lets you use bigger holds to achieve failure in roughly the same amount of time. It lets you generally use kind of more comfortable holds. Um, and just practically, it, it can be a little bit faster. It just gets a lot more uh, sort of overall muscle engagement, which is probably good. Another tip I have is when you're doing continuous style training, especially sort of um, on the wall circuits, if you pop off due to, you know, you miss a hold, your foot pops, you're kind of tired and you fumble something, you don't need to stop there and wait until the next set. It can often be better to take a short rest 30 seconds or less, chalk up and just get back on the on the wall. With endurance in, in general, it's like, it is kind of a grind. And so sort of the further you can push yourself and the deeper into failure you can get, the higher the relative stress is. If you're new to endurance, you don't need to kill yourself, you'll see progress. If you're well-practiced at endurance, you need to push harder and harder to achieve a functional stress in order to keep adapting. And to want to push yourself that hard often, you need to try to pick styles and methodologies that for you are enjoyable. So because there's so many options here, well beyond even what we covered in this video, you don't need to do any specific intervention that you, for whatever reason, dislike. Try to find one that you enjoy and that enjoyment and the amount of effort you're gonna be able to put into it very likely overwhelms whatever sort of partial benefit you might get from doing some other thing.